Well, I'm Ellie Kim. I'm the director of the Accord Program, which stands for Adult and Child Consortium for Health Outcomes Research and Delivery Science. I can now say that without <laughs> um, So, how many of you were here last time? Okay, so there are some new people. Uh, I'm going to try not to repeat too much, but I do want to make just a few introductory slides for those of you who do not really know what we're talking about at all here. So I'll try not to be repetitive. So we're going to talk today about pragmatic trials and the effectiveness, and I'm going to give you some examples. I'm also going to give you um, some, uh, some designs. That we can talk about in more depth, and you know, we can let the conversation go where, wherever you'd like to go. Uh, please do stop me or you know, ask questions as we go along. Is anyone on Zoom? I don't know whether they can tell me. Okay. <laughs> You're on Zoom, and you can un my, uh, un uh, mute your mic and want to ask a question, please do. So, we're going to our objectives are to understand what CER and types of CER is. Are understand the differences between pragmatic trials versus uh, uh, efficacy or explanatory trials, more classical clinical trials. Understand concepts of external validity and why uh, these two types of trials are important for practice and policy. And talk about applications to your work and interests. And I hope we have plenty of time to do that. So the kind of science we're talking about is P3 which is one step beyond efficacy trials, which are under highly controlled situations. These are effectiveness uh, studies in the real world. And T4, where uh, we're talking about translation to whole populations, sort of the, health, the uh, realm of public health or policy. So why is this kind of science important? Um, internal validity, as you know, as you may know, is, looks at the degree to which conclusions um, can be made about causal relationships. External validity refers to the extent to which the study can be general. Study results can be generalized to different populations and settings. So NIH research um, has been very, very focused on internal validity. When you are in most NIH study sections, they are focusing, focusing primarily on are the scientific methods valid internally for looking at causal relationships. They are uh, much less focused on whether the study is important or whether it is going to be useful for practice, which is sort of the realm of external validity. And this kind of high internal validity, low external validity, has resulted in diminished relevance for practice for many clinicians. So I showed this last time. It takes 17 years on average for 14% of research to translate to practice. Most of what we discover is never translated. So this is the most common kind of research, bench to bookshelf, and uh, the latest research shows that we really should be doing something with all the research we're doing. So that's really the reason for this whole area of pragmatic science. So what does comparative effectiveness, effectiveness research mean? This is the uh, NIH definition, generation and synthesis of evidence that directly compares the harms of alternative methods to prevent, diagnose, treat, and monitor clinical condition or improve the delivery of care. So two approaches, a direct face-to-face -face comparison. Um, and the purpose of this kind of research is to assist consumers, clinicians, purchasers, and policymakers in uh, directly uh, influencing what they're doing in the clinic or in the policy realm. Now, CER, Comparative Effectiveness Research, came out of a whole area called OSER, Observational Comparative Effectiveness Research. Um, and that this area came basically from uh, uh, pharmaceutical and device kind of research, where they were taking huge data sets and doing uh, direct comparisons of data from large data sets. Um, 
And actually, this kind of data result in, resulted in the development of analytic methods like propensity matching to match things in a, uh, in a way you could not do uh, retrospectively before. So then there was uh, a change, and about 2009, there was a lot of growth of CER, particularly um, with a publication by the uh, Institute of Medicine, where they listed 100 priority areas for comparative effectiveness research. So this, em this emerged out of sort of large database work and then moved into the area of comparative trials, CER trials. And they identified about 200 topics, about a quarter of which were applicable to children, 20 specific to children. And just to, to give you um, an idea of how much this changed the field, here's the kinds of things that were priorities, they thought. Comparing care coordination uh, projects, such as medical home, using the parent and managing kids with complex chronic conditions, school-based interventions, uh, preventing treating overweight and obesity, uh, various delivery models and prevent preventing dental injuries in children, um, primary care treatment strategies for ADHD, wraparound home community-based services, and residential treatment in managing severe uh, mental health disorders. So that this is just a smattering of examples, but this was a huge change in the field because all of a sudden there was a real focus on health services research, even at NIH. And I think this is one of the things that pushed NIH much more into T3, T4 science. So one thing to be careful about, <clears throat> depending on the funding program, your comparator group in CER is important. PCORI, everyone heard of PCORI, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Now, I, I'm kind of hopeful that PCORI will continue. It may or may not, but it's been a big source of funding for many, many of us. Uh, in PCORI, they do not like usual care as a comparator group. They want two um, active uh, comparator situations. Many of the other uh, places you might apply to, to funding for don't comment on this, and you can be usual care as long as it's fairly well defined as a comparator group with a new um, uh, type of intervention to compare it to. So that's just a sideline, but you be careful about that if you apply to PCORI. Okay, the other thing that's very important about comparative effectiveness research is the focus on engaging um, the community in which you are serving. So um, recommendation six of the IOM priorities are that CER programs should fully involve consumers, patients, and caregivers in aspects of CER, in, including looking at the kind of outcomes that you're looking at. And that's sort of where the whole patient-centered outcomes thing is. Okay? Um, and here are the seven keys of stakeholders, patient and public, providers, purchasers, payers, product makers, and PIs. So let's talk about pragmatic trials. A pragmatic or effectiveness trial seeks to answer the question, does an intervention work under uh, everyday, real-world conditions? That is opposed to an explanatory or efficacy trial, which is much more uh, the subject of, of, of you know, earlier research, which attempts to answer the question, can an intervention work under ideal conditions? So just to compare these um, in more depth, the purpose uh, of an explanatory trial is to look at efficacy under ideal conditions, whereas a pragmatic trial looks at effectiveness under real-world conditions. The focus of the study is almost always patient level in the explanatory trial, whereas in a community pragmatic trial, it may relate to an individual outcome, but it also may relate to entire populations all the way up to policy. So you may be comparing two different policies. Uh, the setting by design is highly controlled in an explanatory trial, and um, generalized and real world in the heterogeneous trial, in the community pragmatic trial, excuse me. 
Uh, again, the patient population homogeneous by design in the explanatory trial and heterogeneous by design, not not by the way. It is heterogeneous by design in the pragmatic trial. Uh, patient characteristics are generally accounted for uh, with randomization in an uh, explanatory trial. You may have randomization in a pragmatic trial. I'm going to show you an example of one where there was randomization. That I, most of the trials I do do involve randomization. However, because um, the conditions are far less under your control in a pragmatic trial situation, you do need to be much smarter about collecting um, information about other things that may be influencing the trial. In other words, the context. The context is huge in pragmatic trials. Any questions about that conceptually? I'm going to give you an example, and we're going to analyze how pragmatic or unpragmatic a particular trial is, so that'll help. Um, so there's a continuum of pragmatic, right? And it, it's dictated by your situation. Some of you probably do QI work or may do QI work, all the way to people who are doing very tightly controlled studies. This is a continuum. It is not this or that. Um, and it's dictated by things like how generalizable versus specific you want the data to be, who is the audience, um, what are the time constraints, what are funding constraints, and the constraints related to context. You can't always do the ideal study design if your context will not allow you to. But I do want to reinforce the fact that pragmatic research can be rigorous. There's this, you know, this assumption in some people's mind that if it's not a tightly controlled clinical trial, it cannot be rigorous. And I would strongly argue that that is not the case. Um, and I would also encourage you to always consider the most rigorous design and then dial it back as needed and control for what you can't control for as needed. But don't assume that you have to give up all rigor just because you're dealing in the everyday, because you're, because you're trying to do pragmatic, real-world science. Okay, so this is something I just want to bring up as a, to underline the fact that there is this continuum. So this uh, Precis model, which is actually developed by, um, in tandem with Russ Glasgow, who works with us, describes 10 domains that, the effect the, that affect the degree to which a trial is pragmatic versus explanatory, and goes all the way from very explanatory to very pragmatic. So these are the kinds of issues. And here's, for example, the newest diagram. Um, and this is a way of actually graphically describing a trial. Um, and some people get very enamored of this. I think it's a very good tool for understanding, you know, for, for, for you as a PI to think about how pragmatic is this trial, how pragmatic do I want it to be. So things like eligibility, who is allowed to participate, recruitment, how are participants recruited, setting, where's the trial being done, organization, what expertise and resources are needed, how how unusual is this setting? How ideal versus pragmatic? Flexibility in the delivery. How should the intervention be delivered? How much control is there about that issue? Flexibility in the adherence. What measures are in place to make sure that participants actually do what you want them to do, um, which, of course, in a clinical trial is tightly controlled. I mean, an explanatory trial. Follow-up, how closely are participants followed up and how aggressive are you about that? The primary outcome, how relevant is it to people in the trial and your um, community, um, your, essentially your community. Uh, the primary analysis, to what extent are all data included? So these are some examples of things. And here is sort of a graphic presentation of a pragmatic study where almost everything is a five or four, four to five on those parameters versus an explanatory study which is very tightly closed around one and all of those aspects. So this is just a just just a way of getting you to think about the science and the continuum between these types of trials. So uh, I'm not sure we need to go into this much. I think most of you understand why this type of science is needed. Um, the bottom line is making 
research as relevant to the health delivery system context in which you're working or in which you're trying to make policy. So I also want to talk briefly about something called the REAIM framework, and that was also developed by Russ Glasgow, who lives with us um, over the course. It is a framework for planning, evaluating, and reporting pragmatic trials, and it kind of helps you think about the type of outcomes that are important in these type of trials. Um, it emphasi emphasizes issues of external as well as internal validity that we've just touched on. It focuses on the context. And use of REAIM has become very widespread. If you submit a uh, trial to NIH, even to NIH, which didn't used to have very pragmatic trials, it's a pragmatic trial, you generally, they would expect you to have some kind of um, framework for which you're thinking about the trial, so some kind of model. It doesn't have to be REAIM. There are, there are a number of other ones. But basically, they're going to expect you to have some kind of um, framework to guide your thinking. So these are the elements of re-aim, reach, which is at the individual level. This is how, what percent of the target audience that you were trying to um, get this intervention to actually received it. Effectiveness, and here um, you generally do have one primary outcome, but you may have secondary outcomes that's entirely acceptable in a pragmatic trial. There's the expectation that you'd have outcomes in each of these levels. That's a very important difference as well between explanatory and a pragmatic trial. And then you have a number of outcomes at the contextual level. Um, adoption is the extent to which the intervention was used and implemented by target staff settings or institutions. Implementation looks at usually process measures about acceptability, feasibility, barriers and facilitators to implementation, and basically how things were changed in the process of implementation. And then maintenance has to do with sustainability. So plan, I'm writing a trial, I'm, I'm writing a R01 right now that is a pragmatic trial, and I'm using REAIM as a framework, and I, I have a little table in my, um, in my grant that explains each of the outcomes in each of these areas. So it's just one example of a model. Yeah. Um, Ellie, you mentioned there it's one example. Are there other examples, or could you tell us other examples of maybe why you wouldn't use this in one of the other examples, or when you would use this, or should we just always use this? I can't tell you to always use this. But no, <laughs> any, any kind of theoretic framework you use is going to be imperfect. It's just a tool to okay. help you. There is, you know, I would refer you, there's a really great book, a new DNI book, and it has all of the, uh, there are lots of models you could use. I find this one the most, the, the easiest. But there are a lot of models, which I, I honestly can't tell you all the names of. But um, most of them are, they're kind of similar. They, they, they have contextual factors, patient level factors, um, implementation issues, and they use slightly different names. But um, there is, there's a chapter in the new DNI book by um, Ross Bronson. That's a great chapter. I have it if you want to borrow it from me. And there's actually, you know, there is a new DNI introductory course that's being taught by, um, oh gosh, the name is Lee B. Oh, well. No, not Jody's. Anyway, it's, it's, it's almost all focused on models, frameworks. And, and here models. at our university? What? Or it's here being taught? Yeah, it's, it's going to be taught in, these, uh, in this, the grad school. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's part of the uh, Master's of Clinical Science oh, okay. Thank that will be available to you. So that's, that is focused a lot on frameworks and just theoretical frameworks for DNI science. Anyway, it's just, this is just one example. So I want to go through a few trial designs um, before I give you an example of a pragmatic trial. So I think we would all agree um, that if you have a choice, and it's possible, even in a pragmatic trial, an individual randomized trial design would still be the strongest. So here you have an example where you have three practices. You want to study an intervention 
in each of those practices. This practice is obviously different, right? Um, and so it's you know, it's ideal if within each practice you can randomize the patient level. That's perfect because then you control for the context and you have the tightest trial design. And actually, um, we often are able to do this. But the problem is, if you've got an intervention that has to happen at the practice level, you can't do individual randomization. And in fact, it's, almost, it, it's very difficult to do anything that involves practice redesign or change in practice that can be individually uh, randomized. I can, uh, I do a lot of immunization delivery work. We can randomize the patient level to a possible number of people. You know, we can do that behind the scenes. They either get one, two, or three mail reminder recalls, or they get a text message, whatever. That can all happen on the individual level without any interaction with <coughs> practice. But most interventions in health services research do require um, focus on the practice for it, or whatever unit you're talking about. It may be a school or whatever. So then the next strongest, or the, the next most common design is a cluster randomized trial. And here you have, uh, here you have 12 practices and you're gonna randomize to treatment and control group. But what's the problem here? So the problem is that the clusters may look different, right? Um, and there's two, two things, that the, the practices may be quite different. So you may have randomization and the random, there aren't, you know, usually in a cluster randomized trial, there aren't that many clusters compared to Individuals. You're not going to have thousands of practices. You're not going to have thousands of schools. So you're more limited in the capacity of randomization to control for differences. Um, and then the other thing is that I'm on the wrong slide. No, okay. Um, is that you 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 have clustering within each of these practices that you have to control for. Okay. So. What you really want to be able to do is have balanced randomization within the practice. This is uh, just, just to let you know there are methods of doing this. And this is one we use a lot called covariate constrained randomization. I'm not going to get into the complexities of it because it's actually very complex. But basically, this requires baseline data on relevant group level variables that you think could, control, could, could have an effect on your outcome and or risk. Uh, risk variables for the outcome. Okay, so if you can, if you can, um, before the trial starts, if you know, if you have enough information about, let's say, those 12 practices, and you can, um, you, on relevant important factors, for example, in immunization delivery, you need to know things like percent Medicaid in the practice. That's huge in terms of what's going to happen with an intervention. You need to know things like the baseline up to date rate at that practice for the vaccine you're looking at. You know, those are examples of things where you would put those into covariate, covariate constraint randomization. Basically, what you do with this is you, you get, get all these data and you look at all possible randomizations. So, this is where you use like a Monte Carlo you know, model and you create thousands of randomizations, and then you look at which meets your criteria for plus or minus 10% variation on each of these things, uh, bringing all of them together, and then you randomly select one of those that, you know, from the group that looks good. So it's kind of a complicated way of bringing in the factors you already know about practices and saying, okay, based on this, the best we can do is these 10 practices will go into intervention, these 10 practices will go into does not always work perfectly, but it worked pretty darn well. You can't use too many, and um, as I said, you include variables you think could be directly related to the outcome or might affect uh, intervention implementation. And I'm going to show you an example. The other uh, thing, that I, thing I want to bring up quickly is a step wedge design. Has anyone ever used this? Are you aware of what it is? Okay, so basically this is absolutely perfect for a multi-site introduction of something. Let's say uh, you want to use a sepsis prediction model and you're going to introduce it into uh, 12 hospitals 
But, you know, the implementation is hard. You know, you, you've got to get each group up and going. So this is a perfect situation where you maybe want to step uh, uh, each of those or every two of those hospitals into the intervention in a, in a uh, progressive manner. So here's an example. You have four clusters here. So in T1, the first cluster goes into intervention. T2, the first two. T3, uh, the top three, and then T4, all of them are in. Now the, the nice thing about this is it's much stronger than a pre-post design in that you are using all of the controls for control and all of the interventions for intervention data, okay? So you glom them all together, it gives you a lot more power. And it, the key is they have to be reasonably well matched, right? If the sites look really different, that can cause problems. Uh, one of the ways you, you deal with that is by randomly stepping people in. That's the strongest. You just say, okay, we're going to randomly step people in. Otherwise, if you allow people to, to volunteer, you know that site number one is not the same as site number four, right? So, this, is, this can be a very strong design to know about and very, very accommodating to the real world. Because often, you're not prepared to, to intervene on eight sites at the same time. You'd rather, it would work out well to step this in. We, we did this with some of the asthma. Do all of these groups, like T0 to T1, have to be the same interval of time, T2 to T3? And what do you do if somebody's like, yeah, I could totally do this, and then they're like, oops, no. We're going to be three months behind the game. I mean, ideally, yes, you give them the same amount of time because, of course, uh, the outcomes change over time, so you want to be fairly even about that. Um, if, if somebody <laughs> failed, you might try to replace them. Somebody who looked like them. Or what if they said, like, how do you deal with it if somebody, it's not that they're going to bail, but they're going to be a month behind schedule? Is there a way to counteract for that on the back end? Uh, not really. It might be, you know. Uh, yeah, there probably is. I mean, you could you could look at their data. Um, you could allow them, you know, you, you could allow them to get the same amount of data collection, just to have started a little later and start the next one. You know, you could adjust the same. So you would potentially, if like the third one was the problem, then you would actually potentially readjust the fourth one too. Probably so. I mean, it's going to create a little bit of imbalance. You know, you've got. You've got the first two having a slightly longer time. But it's not, it's not a big deal, I don't think. And the biostatisticians could probably figure out something to do with that, like sensitivity and sensitivity. OK, so just remember that this is a very powerful design um, for that kind of situation. Now I'm going to present a result of a pragmatic trial that I did, and I've actually done about six of these in this area. And then we're going to analyze together how pragmatic or explanatory this trial was. Okay, so be thinking about that while I go through it. Okay, so this is a, um, a comparison of a population based versus a practice based reminder recall effort. Um, I'm sorry, you've heard this before. <laughs> um, so here was the problem we were trying to increase the proportion of children 19 to 35 months who were completely up to date according to recommended vaccines. Healthy People 2020 target was 80%. And we were, at the United States, we were about 73%, 68% in Colorado. Okay, so we had some movement we could, we could improve. So uh, the, the method we were using is reminder recall. Reminder being some kind of notice that says uh, pretty soon you're due for this vaccine. Recall being you're already overdue. Overdue for this vaccine. We kind of use those terms together because invariably there are some people in different group, groups. Um, so this this type of intervention has been shown to be efficacious in increasing immunization rates, basically in all groups, to the tune of five to twenty percent, depending. Um, however, it's difficult to implement even within highly motivated practices using. Uh, an immunization information system, which is a statewide immunization registry, okay? And actually, when you look at, there's there's a couple of Cochrane reviews. You all know what a Cochrane review is? It's basically a, a, a high-level look at the quality of the evidence and, you know, bringing many trials together. 
Uh, there are a couple of Cochrane reviews that show mine recall to be extremely efficacious. But when you look at the studies that were done, with very few exceptions, they were done by outside teams like myself coming into a practice, doing reminder recall, and showing how effective it could be. Very few of these trials are a practice deciding to do reminder recall and showing that kind of effectiveness. So this is, that's an issue of sustainability and implementation in the real world, okay? So efficacious but effective, not so much, because it, it's been estimated in, in several studies that less than 20% of physicians nationally are doing mind recall. So we are reason that maybe a population-based approach where mind recall is done centrally by a public health department using the IIS could reduce the burden on practices and potentially reach people who weren't even patients who weren't even assigned to the practice. So this is a very pragmatic question, right? You're the state health department, how are you going to approach getting rates up? So here's our objectives to directly, this was a comparative effectiveness, pragmatic trial. Uh, we compared effectiveness and cost effectiveness of these two approaches, population-based and practice-based. And um, we, did, we did randomize 14 counties, entire counties, six urban and eight rural. So we did a stratified uh, randomization because rural and urban actually are pretty different in terms of their healthcare delivery. Uh, and we did use, oh, I think, oh, okay, darn it. We did use uh, covariate constrained randomization in this trial. So we did, there were something like 5,000 potential randomizations that came out of it, and we picked out of, I think there were five that were very good. We picked one randomly. And that's how we assigned um, the intervention control. Okay, so we used that method. Okay, so in the intervention, in the practice based recall counties, um, all practices were invited to participate in a web training. Uh, and so they didn't have to go anywhere. All they had to do was you know, look at the web and do this training. Um, we suggested particular methodology, three mailings um, for those children not up to date, and we offered them financial support for doing mailings. So that was probably, we figured, about the most any state health department pragmatically would do, right? We could have held their hand more, but we thought that was a, a pretty reasonable pragmatic approach. And this was based on information from state health departments telling us, well, what is the most of the cost of the thing? Um, <coughs> Can yeah. I just ask, what, how would that compare to the sort of intervention you would do as an outside group coming in, these sort of earlier trials that showed effectiveness? Were those done by providing personnel who would actually then seek, you know, review that practices uh, database, specifically do the mailings, right. et cetera? So that, that's the, uh, yes. At the practice level, what I would do as a researcher is get their approval, and then, yeah, I'd have my, my research. Yeah. So the, the limitation here the is the IIS or the EHR, usually the IIS, and send those to Right. Right. So this is them saying, okay, with appropriate support and training and and <coughs> financial compensation, which is one of the things they tell us is <coughs> How many will do this? Okay. And what will be the effect if they do? In the population-based counties, uh, the recall effort was done essentially by the state public health departments, and recall notices went out with the county health department logos, um, as well as if the practice chose to do so, they can include their name. And uh, we use the same recall methodology, so three reminder recalls by mail. Okay, so here is the, the big punchline of this trial. In the practice-based, In the practice-based uh, counties, only 5%, that was 10 practices, did reminder recall. That resulted in the very largest number of kids that could have been reached. So that's the reach of re-aim, okay? 887. In the population-based reminder recall, we had about 15% of kids where we could not update the addresses you know, it did not come back with the correct address. So we, 
reached, we think, 85%, which was about 11,000 children. So that's the biggest take home of this. We could not motivate threatening uh, practices. So here's the effectiveness. 32% um, uh, received a vaccine within six months versus 23% the practice base for an absolute effect difference of 9%. Um, the costs were much lower in the centralized approach, $250 for practice versus $1,300. Uh, the cost effectiveness, this is a cost per child receiving one or more vaccines, $10 in the population base versus $38 in the practice base. And uh, just, just to make the point that this is not, this, this trial does not say the reminder recall doesn't work if it's done by the practices, right? It doesn't say that at all. Because here, in fact, is a sub-analysis within the 10 practices, those who did recall, 39%, versus uh, that were in the, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Okay, so this is the comparison within practice base of those who did or did not know. Those, this is the population base, excuse me. So this is the population base that did reminder recall. This is the practice base that did reminder recall. So in fact, it worked better if the practices did it. Now, that's not randomized. So the practices and the patients in that group um, are quite different, probably. But the bottom line is it, it wasn't ineffective to the practices did it, it worked fine, but they, we couldn't get it to do it. So at a population level, at a pragmatic science level, it did not work very well to do it at the practice level. Okay. Uh, that's yeah. another question just sure. about that, that trial and how that sort of implies. What, did you ever identify what the barriers were to those other practices that didn't want to participate? Um, in this trial we didn't because it was huge, but we have before. We've done a lot of qualitative work. We did one um, study where we simply, you know, we did this. We we offered them training mm -hmm. and we saw what they do, and then we interviewed them. And it's a it's a myriad of things. Some of them said financial, despite the fact that we were compensating. Mm -hmm. um, mostly, my impression is the strongest um, deterrent is just the um, competing demands of primary. This is just not something people feel like they can assign someone to do, given the complexity of things. We had a lot of different uh, things like, okay, we trained someone and then they left. So after they left, nobody paid any attention to it anymore. So it's, it's very hard to get things changed at the practice level. I, I spent about 10 years doing it before I decided, you know, <laughs> is there a business case to be made for those sorts of practices to say, hey, if you do this, they'll come in and get their immunizations, a number of those will have sort of secondary issues that need to be developed, your population grows? We've actually shown that to be true, you know, that it, it improves the uh, preventive care visit rate and therefore has financial implications, but it's not strong. Not enough. I mean, the problem, you know, and I am a primary care physician, and I also do surveys I've uh, done surveys for the last like 10 years on physicians nationally, both in the American Academy of Pediatrics and AAFP. Primary care doctors are inundated. Yeah, they don't care. They, they are, you know, you, you suggest one more thing they need to do, and they right. are screaming out of the room. So don't, don't, don't I think that's volume. the biggest issue. There's lots of, uh, lots of things they can state that are problems, but even if you try to solve those problems, the chances of changing something are, are very difficult. So my feeling is if you don't have to do it at the practice level, don't do it at the practice level. There are many things that have to happen at the practice level. But this is not one of them. That's a, that's a good explanation for your data coming out the way that it did that would really emphasize the, the end result. Right. Um, so basically, let's, let's just talk about this, though, as, a, as a, an example um, of pragmatic versus explanatory. So how pragmatic do you think the participants here were? How pragmatic were we in selection of participants? I mean, let me put it a different way. How tightly controlling were we? Who's going to say we're a five? Who's going to say we're a one? How, how pragmatic? 
Five is the most. Five, five is the most pragmatic, yes. Five is the most pragmatic? I think it's four. Three to four. Because you. Okay, so why why don't you think it's a five? Because you had rural versus urban. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's well, it's not a one three, but um, you did you did look and try to um, pick them that way. Well, we did. We certainly, in terms of the randomization, we did do fair amount to balance. Them, right? We didn't just say, you know, whatever counties. Get around. We, we did do some work balancing them, right? So that's a little bit less okay. than pragmatic. That's a little bit tighter. Um, so I would agree, it's not a five. And it's not the entire state, it's a selection. Right. So that's going to, well, I don't know what that bias yeah. is. It's almost the entire state, uh, but we did exclude, you're right, we, we excluded, I didn't get into that, but we excluded frontier counties and a few outliers where they were already doing centralized reminder recall by the county. And we excluded Boulder for reasons I probably don't have to explain. <laughs> because they are such an outlier. Yeah. Um, but but in other other than that, we did include the entire state. But that's a that's a good point. Um, the other thing, think about how we selected the population. It was based on who was in the IIS, uh, Immunization Information System. How tight is that? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to ask questions about how do people get into the IIS. How do they get the, out of the IIS? The truth is, people get into the IIS by having had an, a vaccine uploaded to the IIS. And there are, certainly are some um, data about how good the IIS is in Colorado, i.e. it's very high, 96% of uh, six-year-olds have several vaccines in there. But the question is, how accurate is their contact information and how about people that move in or out of the state? What happens with them? So there's some wiggle room there, right? And that's pretty pragmatic. Uh, and we actually had to really substantiate that, uh, you know, the parameters about that when we published this. Um, but I mean, what, what helps you here in that regard? I mean, this is a pragmatic problem, right? You can't enumerate who's in a county who's being seen by primary care. How did we deal with that? We randomized, right? So presumably, things aren't happening really differently with respect to who's in the IIS counties, or you would hope that randomization would balance that. So it's a mix. Because you don't know who your denominator, like you don't know who, so that people, if they've never, now since I know more about the system, if they've never had a vaccine, they're not in there. And they're so you're not still not account, you're still not getting those. So the people that live in Boulder, you wouldn't get necessarily if they've never had an immune, in a, uh, a vaccine to date, they wouldn't have been a target in your intervention anyway. That's exactly right. Okay. So there are, there are, there are biases being introduced by the <coughs> lack of ability to enumerate the denominator. But that, and that's a very common problem yeah. in pragmatic trial. But, you know, here we were able to fairly well balance that, we thought. There wasn't a compelling reason to think that, um, you know, particular counties would have different participation. If there were, then you'd have to adjust for it. Okay, how about the setting? Did we do anything funky in terms of, I, I, I think that was actually is what you were mentioning in terms of did we exclude certain parts of the state, that kind of thing. So that was, that was pretty pragmatic with, with a little minor exception. I mean, we couldn't really include frontier states because there's frontier counties because they're so small and underpopulated. Um, organization, what kind of expertise and resources were needed to deliver this intervention? Were we, did we require, you know, so the automated a very system. unreal level of expertise, for example? Not so much expertise, but, but uh, practical. You know, you, you provide education to the offices, but you actually had somebody do the work of the mailings and uh, in the central portion. So they were different interventions in that sense. Well, of, different people were doing it, for sure, yeah. yeah. And, and we knew how to do it, and they didn't. But 
Apparently, we tried to balance yeah. that as much as we could. We didn't require but, them to import an IT person that exactly. was knowledgeable or right. something like that. It's you, fairly real world, right? But, but yeah, I would say that's, I guess that makes it pragmatic in the sense that, yes, you weren't giving them a person to actually do this or exactly. a salary <laughs> for a person to actually do this. Right. But in that pragmatic sense, you were giving them all the opportunity that they should have needed. Exactly. Um, uh, let's just see. Primary outcome. The primary outcome here was receipt of one or more vaccines. But you can see, uh, I'm just going to, since we're running out of time, highlight a few things. You can see how multiple outcomes were very important here. So if you get a clinical trialist in a room and you tell them you have more than one outcome in a trial, they go, oh, this Why is this? Because in the purest sense, you need to just look at one primary outcome because everything else might have been, you know, you might have thought of it later. And therefore, you know, been driven by your data rather than by hypotheses. Very different viewpoint in pragmatic trials. I don't think anyone should do a pragmatic trial without using mixed methods. That means they do some qualitative work often beforehand to plan the trial, um, frequently afterwards to see what worked, what didn't work, and reasons for why things did or didn't work. Because sometimes you get an answer you don't understand, and there may have been you know, a lot of these other things we talked about. Um, you know, the adoption, the implementation. If you don't look at those issues, you may not understand the reasons for why something so here, you know, what really failed is the practices or unwillingness to, to do this. Okay, I just want to, first of all, any, I, I wanted to be able to discuss the relevance to your work. We only have a few minutes, but are there questions that you have about your own work that you want to ask? Yeah. Um. So you're saying there, generally there's multiple outcomes that you're looking at in pragmatic trials. And there's a standard for, and one of the reasons you don't want to do that in clinical trials is you inflate your type one error. And so if there was a standard for doing multiple testing, if you use some sort of correction. Um, definitely, statistically, you can use the correction. I guess I don't want to, I, I want to emphasize the types of outcomes, multiple outcomes you're looking at are different. Often you will have one primary effectiveness outcome, okay. but you may have secondary ones as well because you, you can see from a policy perspective, we decided on one, which is receipt of one more vaccine. But it's also important how many the percent that gets up to date and how much it costs. These are effectiveness outcomes as well. Um, so you know if you if you have a few. Um, outcomes, you're not going to have a correction issue. It's when you have 10 outcomes that you have a big correction issue. And a lot of these other outcomes are quality, so they're not going to be, it's not going to be a P that. It's not going to be a one Other questions? Winnie, are, are any of you thinking about doing pragmatic or comparative effectiveness trials? Maybe? I'm, I'm in, <laughs> definitely engaged in uh, comparative effectiveness <laughs> research. So uh, just as a uh, the, the primary study that I've, I've been engaged in in the past, we set up in a little different way than what you're discussing here because it was very focused. Small group of patients who are distributed across a large number of practices, rare diseases. Um, and so we set this up by developing, uh, doing our, our restriction or, or our uh, control by uh, deciding ahead of time on a set of uh, identification criteria, severity criteria for stratification, and then working out our, uh, summarizing our, our potential interventions and, and whittling that down to three that we couldn't get people to decide on a consensus towards. And that became our comparative effectiveness study then was to say, if we just allow all practitioners in the country to treat the patients as they think are best within these parameters of these three protocols. It's, they wouldn't, you know, this part of the country said they needed this one, this part of the country said we only do this one. 
um, as long as they were enrolling patients with the same criteria, tracking the same parameters, measuring the same end outcomes, we could tell them how they balanced against each other over time. And over two years, we were able to say, well, you know, this group actually had much better outcomes than your, this group did. Everybody has shifted over to, to side one. Um, so that's really an interesting combination yeah. of pragmatic and not pragmatic, right? Exactly. Tightly controlling some aspects, but, but allowing choice in the yes. treatment. So did people have to go all with one type of treatment? Could no, they do all they, three? They could do any of the three. In fact, so we had sites that only did one, sites that only did another, and then some sites that tried all three. And depending on weight, what they thought, because it was a, it was a sort of a, we think more severe patients should get more aggressive care versus less severe patients should get less aggressive care. In the end, the answer was all patients did better with more aggressive care. But since we did not, there was no data in this whole field to drive anything, you could never get anybody to agree yeah. without you know, arguing about it. Um, so that became <laughs> was that a, an NIH funded study? Is it NIH like that? No, this was a, uh, we funded this ourselves because yeah. no, no, the NIH wouldn't fund it. Okay. Didn't have any, didn't have any data to say that our, our means of identifying patients were correct, our, our severity scoring was correct, all of that sort of stuff. This was, you know, sort of built all that at the same time. Well, that could have been a Corey grant. Yeah. Corey likes those kinds right. of things. Right. Well, the Arthritis Foundation helped us with it in this one. But, yeah, but it, it, you're right, though. This was a, uh, it was a struggle to sort of figure out how we're going to do that and what, are, what statistic modeling can we do ahead of time when we had no power calculations and no preliminary data to drive us. That's very difficult. The struggle. But it, 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 it then starts a, a process. Once you have a data set like that and you have a comparator, now it's quite easy to design secondary comparative effectiveness research to say, or studies that say, well, you know, here's a new medicine that people are thinking of using. What would we do to compare it to what we now consider our base? Uh, that, do, that dual active pathways um, yeah. works much better. Well, you know, it's, that, that was a complicated thing, though, because, you know, if you, if you had all three groups in one site, you had to control for clustering, you know, of yep. patients with, within each site. It was a very complicated issue, but would, it sounds like say, you've got a pretty clear answer. It, it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's the sort of thing that when we, we had 10 sites, 50 patients, so it's never going to be a really right. strong uh, signal, but it, it is. It was strong enough that the uh, the experts in the field said this is something we believe in. Where the people who were convinced beforehand without data for one path said, "Nah, you've convinced me this other way is better, yeah. and I'll do what what the group has identified." Well, you know, rare uh, diseases is particularly, you know, <laughs> yeah. a whole set of problems in themselves. But that's a very clever thing you did. So you, I mean, you work with these very large population questions, and I like that. I'm really interested in the models that you work with. But I think a lot of what we're coping with in these really pragmatic questions in our clinics are turn out to be rare situations or rare diseases, in a sense. Right. That's a subcomplication of something common. Excited to keep learning more. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, comments? Okay, I want to I want to alert you to the uh, what's upcoming. Uh, Lauren Crane is going to give an introduction about survey methodology uh, next time, and then after that, we're going to have somebody who, who runs actually our survey unit um, talk about the nuts and bolts. So that particular uh, talk would be really great for any of your PRAs who are actually on the ground doing surveys. Um, she'll talk about different uh, web-based survey tools, et cetera. So if, if any of you are doing that. Um, and then Susan Moore will give an introduction to mobile health research, which is a great, very interesting field. Um, and then uh, Jody Holtrip, who teaches one of the DNI courses, is going to talk about um, an overview of dissemination and implementation science. Um, and Matt Locke, then, who is a, a Geri geriatric physician, but runs the patient-centered outcome shared decision-making at a course to be sort of an, uh, a really emerging national expert in this area, very highly relevant to pediatrics. So uh, he's going to come talk then. And then we're going to have two lectures, finally, on qualitative methods. The first, whoops, the first from a the first from a sort of a PhD level in terms of types of qualitative methods, the second, again, nuts and bolts about how do you do qualitative work, how